Welcome to the show. I'm excited about today's show because uh, when my children are 13, my twin boys are 10, when they're 13, they're going to be doing a rite of passage. And the gentleman who's going to be overseeing their entire rite of passage, where they'll be out in the wilderness with nothing but their fire making kit and uh, their backpack, and they'll be out there surviving and going through their official passage into manhood. The man who oversees this and is a real expert in these rites of passage for both adults and for children, is Tim Corcoran. My kids go to his wilderness survival school every year. He's been on the podcast before, and now he is, he's uh, really developing this whole concept of the rite of passage even more fully with something he calls Purpose Mountain. We're going to talk about that in today's show. Uh, Today's show, as every show of the Ben Greenfield Fitness episode is, I don't know if that quite rolled off my tongue the right way, but I'm going to stick with it, is brought to you by Keon. One thing that you may not realize we have over there is an anti-aging serum that I spent a couple of years formulating. Uh, It is jam-packed with 12 essential oils that have been studied and proven to reduce scars and wrinkles to uh, cause a an increased glow and complexion on the face and to essentially cause a, a full face or wherever you put it really I'll put it on on wounds cuts scrapes bruises put it on my face every day it has this incredible anti-aging effect in terms of the way that your face appears. Uh, it can uh, basically reverse a lot of the damage from from sun, from living in a dry area, from excess exposure to poor personal care products for a long period of time, you name it. This stuff heals your face, it feeds your face, and uh, most importantly, it battles the signs of skin aging and reverses the clock on your face. It's uh, called Keon Anti-Aging Skin Serum. Keon Anti-Aging Skin Serum. And you can get it over at GetKeon.com, where we also have coffee and we have a fat loss supplement that I designed and a whole bunch of other supplements for everything from muscle gain to digestion to uh, mental performance, you name it. So Keon, uh, GetKeon.com, K-I-O-N. Finally, this podcast is brought to you by Gaines Wave. Gaines Wave is this revolutionary new way for men and women who want to optimize their sexual performance, who want longer orgasms, better sex, better feeling down in their nether regions uh, to fix everything. Uh, it's a pulsating sound wave frequency that they use to increase blood flow to your unit, and it gives you guys a firmer, more resilient erection. For women, it increases blood flow, uh, and it's just sound waves. It encourages the growth of new blood vessels, which increases oxygen and nutrient delivery to your genitalia. And it works. I've done it four times now. And every time, you know, I come back and for months, I'm like a 16 year old boy. It's pretty cool. So you can get a 30% discount on your first Gainswave treatment. They're all over the United States. Uh, just go to gainswave.com slash Ben to find a provider near you. That's gainswave.com slash Ben to save 30% off your first treatment with Gainswave. In this episode of the Ben Group from Fitness Show. I think the bigger, you know, part of the conversation we need to address is that a rite of passage is really part of a longer mentoring process. And so at this time of transition, when we're coming back to what it means to be a holistic human being, you know, I really want to encourage people out there to to invest in community and culture, but to build those relationships. And that's really how our soul speaks to us, is through dreams, images, signs, symbols. Um, nature connection moments. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed. Mobility. Balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there when you look at all the studies done, studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. All the information you need in one place, right here, right now, on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Hey 
Hey folks, it's Ben Greenfield, and I was just chatting with my buddy Tim Corcoran even before we started recording about a hunt that I just got back from in Kona, where I hunted some some scrub cow, some jungle cow, which are actually incredibly difficult to hunt, surprisingly difficult to hunt, and then also uh, sheep and pig, pig that is amazingly tasty, fatty pig fed on macadamia nuts. And, um, Tim, you also, did you just recently start hunting or have you been hunting for a while? Well, no, no, I've, I, I just recently started hunting. You know, I, I did not grow up hunting. Uh, my family didn't hunt. My dad did not hunt. Um, and once I got involved with nature connection work in my early twenties, you know, 20 years ago, uh, hunting was like a real dream for me. Um, it's something that I held on a, in high regard, uh, so, but I waited quite a while. I waited until just, I don't know, five years ago to really get started in earnest. Uh, and at that time, I found a mentor. I found a, uh, actually a local Native American mentor, a good friend of mine um, I'm from the Spokane tribe of Indians. And then I also found a, a, a really local, uh, another friend who's a local mentor who taught me, um, taught me all about the landscape here and how to, how to go after the white-tailed deer. Um, so, yeah, so I've been hunting... Um, this past fall, I think I got my third whitetail. Well, I figure you're probably a pretty good hunter because, you know, when I first met you, it was because I was looking for someone to come up to my land and teach me and my boys about how to right. harvest wild edible plants from our land. Cause we want to know what we could eat. We want to know what the medicinal or the edible use of certain compounds were. And you took us around and showed us wild nettle and mullein and comfrey and organ grapefruit right. and wild mints. And that was my first introduction to you was as this big wealth of wilderness knowledge. And for those right, of you right. who didn't get a chance I to, to listen, I actually talked to Tim. We, we did a whole podcast on how to find wild edibles and just to, this, this whole concept of nature connection and animal tracking. We talked a little bit about hunting in that last episode mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and on this show, rather than repeating a lot of the stuff that we went into in the last show with Tim, which I'm going to put a link to over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash purpose, I want to talk a little bit more about the reason that I've been sending my kids to attend mm. Tim's Wilderness Survival Camp and also the the winter and the spring adventure camps that he puts on over here in the, in the Spokane, Washington and northern idaho area because mm. uh, tim actually has a, a pretty big passion for 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 kids and for the development of really robust young human beings and and this idea of giving our kids a lot more than what culture gives it these days and so tim i want to i want to jump into i know what you call purpose mountain if you're game sure 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 Okay. And and by the way, for those of you listening in, Tim himself has a has a couple of kids. What are your kids' names again, Tim? I've got two boys, uh River, who's my oldest, he's eleven, and Forrest, who is my youngest, who's eight. That's right. River and Forrest. And, Hi and you've got names. two boys. Yeah. yeah. You've got two boys, River and Terran, right? Uh huh. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So you've got River and Forrest. I've got River and Terran. And uh, all, of course, also, by the way, if any of you ever get a chance to attend any of Tim's wilderness survival camps or any of the adventure camps that he puts on, you're probably also going to run into his wife, Janine, who my my best memory of, my fondest memory of, was that she was the one of the camp cooks for the wilderness, the father-son wilderness survival camp that we went on, and she makes these amazing, amazing foods, but off the land, like off of all the wild plants. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, so you're, you're a lucky man. A lucky man who... Well, who, thank you. I am. Who, I like, am. like me, surprisingly, is still skinny, uh, despite getting, getting cooked amazing <laughs> food. <laughs> right, so. right. Um, well, it helps to be outside a lot, right? Yeah, exactly. You're probably outside more than I am. So uh, anyways, though, Tim, I had reached out to you because yeah. I've been on this kick lately, and, and kick is kind of a trite word to use, but I've been becoming more and more interested in the the problem with effeminate men in our culture and 
you know, the, this whole demasculinization, it seems, of, of many of oh, yeah. the guys in our culture who are now, you know, playing video games and shopping for kale at Whole Foods and doing Bikram yoga, but not really able to tap into some of the more intense aspects of masculinity that you might find in books like, um, uh, th- there's, a, there's a great book called, uh, why am I blanking on it now? Right at the time that I'm recording, it's by David Dita. Do you know the, uh, the way, oh, yeah, of, yeah. The, uh, yeah. Way, way of the superior man? Yeah. Way of the superior man. And then there's sure. another, another book, uh, and this is more of like a, uh, Carl Jungian psychology type of mm-hmm. book about the warrior, the lover, the king, and the magician, and how right. king, warrior, you know, magician, lover. Yeah, that's yeah, a, yeah. King, more warrior, Gillette. magician, lover. How many boys kind of just stay in this boy stage and never truly become men. Right. And right. It, and when I had, did a podcast a few months ago with Paul Check. He got into how he thought that this whole issue with not just men, but but you know to a certain extent, you could say the same thing about girls in our society. There's no uh, there's no vision quest. There's no rite of passage. There's no official crossing over into adulthood that we tend to see so prevalently displayed in many ancestral cultures. And because right. of that, you know, many adults in our day and age are still uh, kids. Inside. I mean, even myself, I still feel in many cases, I was talking about this with my wife the other day, as though I never really had a passing from being a boy into being a man. Like you, I didn't grow up, you know, with, with a father who taught me how to how to hunt. Yeah. I didn't have any any special rite of passage or vision quest that I went through that officially marked me as a man. And I think it's a big problem in our day and age. Huge. Huge. Yeah, so, well, you, you, we've already covered a lot, <laughs> and, and where to jump in. I mean, I guess I'll say, you know, at this point in my life, Ben, uh, my interest is really in supporting human beings of all ages to develop holistically. And so, yes, you know, I'm still running Twin Eagles Wilderness School along with my wife. We have hundreds of kids come through every year. And as you mentioned, I've started a new business, Purpose Mountain, that's really geared towards uh, working with adults very specifically, not so much, um, not exclusively in, in the realm of nature connection, but of course in this realm of helping people to discover their purpose, which is tied right in with this whole conversation. Um, you know, I mean, from my perspective, what I see is that developmentally as human beings, especially here in the modern American culture, um, I think it's safe to say that our culture has largely been arrested in adolescence. You know, we, we do develop from babies to toddlers and from toddlers to kids and from kids to adolescents, but largely speaking, the vast majority of, certainly of America here in the Western world, the, the, the real development stops at that point. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Clearly, one of the big ones is our lack of connection to nature. And as you mentioned, which of course ties right into our lack of uh, mature, appropriate uh, rites of passage, right? And and we could take a moment and define that, because uh, that word does get thrown around a lot, and oftentimes people uh, mix that up with the term initiation. You know, in my book, classically, if you, if you look to the classic works of you know, mythologists like Joseph Campbell uh, or others, a rite of passage is, is a type of initiation that marks the transition from one life phase to the next. And when we consider that, you know, life phase change, right, we're talking about birth, uh, we're talking mm-hmm. about entry into childhood, entry into adolescence, entry into adulthood, um, you arguably becoming a parent, uh, and becoming an elder, and then death. So we don't have that many different phases of life, right? Um, there's only a handful. Uh, now, and with an initiation, initiation is simply uh, an, an intense uh, process that we go through that might mark a, a different chapter of life. So maybe a, an initiation for me was starting my new business last year, right? But that didn't. That was different from stepping into a new life phase. Mm-hmm. Um, so, a rite of passage is like a, a specialty initiation. What would yeah. be an example of, of some rites of passage that we see in other cultures? Oh yeah, I mean, gosh, there's tons. Um, 
you know, uh, uh, I mean, classic, some, some classics would be uh, the Australian Aborigines have their walkabout, uh, right, where kids, uh, and this was, was and, and it's actually worth acknowledging, you know, because we're talking about the old cultures, a big part of my work, uh, the vast majority of my adult life, I've really put towards connecting with and learning from indigenous culture, especially here in North America. Um, I've been blessed to have a number of elders and mentors uh, that were are indigenous to to North America, and I've learned so much. Um, but yeah, some classic rites of passage would be the Australian Aborigine walkabout, and uh, the kids when they grow up, they would hear stories, and and there would be songs in the culture that they would hear about the landscape. You know, the the verses and the parts of the story, chapters of the story, were explaining um, the the various forms and, um, and landmarks on the land. And then when it came time for them to step out of childhood and into adulthood, they would be sent off on their walkabout. They wouldn't know where they're going. The elders would send them off and say, okay, you know, this is it. This is your time. And they'd have to practice survival skills. They'd have to, you know, acquire their own food from hunting and gathering. And they wouldn't quite know where to go. But then they were told at the last minute, they said, just remember that song that was always sung to you or recall that story that we always told you and they would sing that song back to themselves or tell that story and it would have in it uh, like a secret map right and as as they went through each verse it told them okay now go to the mountain that looks like you know a kangaroo's belly or whatever it was and go from the one spot to the next to the next and sure enough that would lead them on their adventure um, other rites of passage. Well, cloud, we were talking about hunting. Hunting has been used as a rite of passage mm-hmm. um, for many, many, many years, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and then, of course, um, the vision quest, uh, or you know, it's more simply put, the solo. You know, this this idea of taking pause. So, well, a mentor once called the vision quest like the the great time out of life. Okay, call a time out on life. Pause. Go out into wild nature, right, somewhere remote, and just completely surround yourself, immerse yourself in wildness, and pick a spot that calls to you, uh, or perhaps your elders have picked a spot for you, and ask that, and then and then be there for four days, four nights, 96 hours, fast from everything familiar, you know, make that sacrifice. Maybe you know, some vision quests would have water, some some don't. Um, so what's it, what's the difference between a vision quest and rite of passage? Yeah, well, let, let me just finish that last thought. And then the, the essential question of the vision quest being, what is my purpose? Hmm. Why am I here? Um, so the difference between a vision quest and a rite of passage, great question. So a, a rite of passage, again, we defined as an initiation that's going to take us from one life phase to another. And a vision quest um, can be used as part of a rite of passage, and it can also be used um, in other ways. So, you know, for the young person or the not-so-young person who's ready to really um, go through a rite of passage and claim their their place in, in the adult community, um, a vision quest is, is a part of that, is a part of it, but it's not the whole thing. Um, as well... You know, I mean, I've done a half dozen vision quests in my life. Some of those, well, one was a rite of passage. The other five were simply times when I was not feeling connected to my life's work, and I was needing a, a refresher, like, hey, what's the, you know, why am I here? What's the current expression of why I'm here? So um, taking a vision quest to reconnect with purpose. But a rite of passage is going to involve a lot more than, just you know, sitting in a in a in a beautiful place in nature for four days, asking, "What's my purpose?" A rite of passage uh, is a ceremony. A rite of passage is really a community event. Uh, traditionally, a rite of passage is as much about the individual going through it as the community, right? Because it's it ties us to culture. And a rite of passage, you know, I facilitate rites of passage, and when. When they happen, it starts with the family. Actually, it's actually a family-based process. Um, if, if we're if we're looking at uh, adolescence, right? 
So boys, for example, I actually just next month I'll be running a boys rite of passage. And I start, and we write, and this is to Mark, leaving behind boyhood and entering into adolescence. And so I, I work with the parents. And it's as much about the parents learning, oh, what does it mean for me to not be the parent of a boy anymore, right? Um, and what is, how does dad need to show up more now for the son, that the son's becoming a young man? And how does mom actually need to step back and not do so much um, nurturing? Does the, does the young man, is he still going to need nurturing? Sure. Um, but that's a classic pattern, right? Would be the dad who's checked out, works, you know, workaholic dad or whatnot, doesn't show up for the kid. Mom is taking on more than her fair share of parenting responsibilities. And then the boy doesn't get proper uh, role modeling, proper mm. patterning on what does it mean to be a man. Right. He, and, but, but he's very good at potentially being a woman and managing some of those things in the household or, you know, kind of getting to his yin side. And, and I even see that sometimes with my own boys, when I leave for a long time, you know, they'll, yeah. they'll kind of start to let fall to the wayside. Some of the things like, you know, the things we would consider to be more yang, you know, going out and, and shooting the bow and working out. And I know I'm, I'm stereotyping to a certain extent here, but engaging in what we might consider to be these more masculine activities that would eventually kind of propel them into manhood, into being able to protect, into being able to provide, into, you know, right. it, you know, the three P's, right? Protect, provide, and, and procreate. And, Yes. And and yeah. then I come home and I and I help assist them to kind of transition back into establishing some of those habits and some of those routines that allow them to be able to do that. But more concerning to me is of course ensuring that unlike my childhood and my upbringing and the issue that I still struggle with which is feeling as though I never crossed that threshold into becoming a man, right? right? I never actually went through a rite of passage. And you could argue that I have gone on vision quests, right? Like I've done plant medicines and ventured out into the sure. wilderness for long sure. periods of time. And many people will do that, right? They'll ask themselves a question and then go off into the forest with, with psilocybin, right? We, we see folks in the fitness right. community, especially go, you know, going out and doing things like ayahuasca retreats or ayahuasca adventures sure. or sure. other forays into plant medicine. But they're, they're kind of few and far between and not very formal and, and really not a distinct part of culture as much as they're something that someone might do when they're, you know, maybe they're 30 years old and they officially decide they want to go try and find themselves and they discover psilocybin or something like that. But in terms of making this transition from boyhood into manhood or from childhood into adulthood, more of a, more, more of a, a structured and readily available thing that, that young men can do at a certain point in their lives. I've got some questions for you. Um, yeah, yeah. If, if your game, first of all, is there an yeah. age, an age at which you think, uh, like, like a, a young man and, and correct me if I'm throwing around the term young man too much. And this is something appropriate for, for like young girls and women too, but an age that they would go through that rite of passage into adulthood. I mean, do we see 13, 15, 18, 20? Sure. Yeah. Well, so I, I think what's important to recognize is that here in our modern world, we actually have a new phase of life that our Earth-based ancestors did not have. And that, of course, is adolescence. You know, if you look back to the old cultures, the kids would transition from childhood to adulthood, somewhere between 13 to 16. There was no adolescence. It just, they went from childhood to adulthood. Lots of reasons for that. Um, you know, from the fact that they didn't live as long to um, the, the, the vast difference in culture. Um, and so I think it's easy to look at that and say, oh, you know, uh, poor us, you know, we've, we've screwed up culturally speaking, and now we have to extend childhood unnecessarily. But I believe there's actually a gift in adolescence. And, I, and when we talk about purpose, I think part of our greater, the greater purpose of uh, the Western world is to really leverage um, the possibility of, of fully harnessing um, the opportunity that adolescence is providing us. So uh, to answer your question, the way I see it, you know, puberty is marking, that's a biological process that's marking the shift out of childhood. So, for example, when I take boys on rites of passage, I look for for their bodies to 
to tell me, right, acne and, you know, uh, the sexual development, the whole, the whole thing, puberty, um, their bodies are indicating when they're ready. And that's not something that can be rushed. You know, there is a natural process to our development as human beings. And so when I do that, I'm initiating them, taking them through that rite of passage from childhood into adolescence. And I use the term young man to describe them when they're in the phase of adolescence. Then there's another rite of passage, really, an ideal scene. Then around the age somewhere, you know, 18 to 24, I would say, there's a second rite of passage, um, which actually could be a third or a fourth because there's other rites of passage before adolescence. Um, But there's a second one there at 18 to 24 where they're leaving adolescence and entering into adulthood. And the key indicator there being, you know, when they're leaving home, when they're truly stepping in to independence, when they're not dependent on their parents for their survival. You know, so these are real basic elements of what it is to be a human being. And as a, an adult male, as a man, you know, I see, and I've learned, I, this is what one of the things I learned from my indigenous teachers and elders, is that I have a responsibility, not just to my family, right, but to the community. So, for example, your sons, you know, I see them a couple times a year, um, and that's not a ton, but I'm, I'm holding them in my heart, right? Like, I have a responsibility to them. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on them, and I'm, I'm checking in with you. We talk occasionally, you know, or, or correspond. And, and I know there's going to come a time when they reach their puberty, and they'll be ready for that rite of passage, and I'm going to be there for them. And so I think the, the bigger, you know, a part of the conversation we need to address is that a rite of passage um, is really part of a longer mentoring process in the ideal scene. And so at this time of transition, when we're coming back to what it means to be a holistic human being, um, you know, I really want to encourage people out there to, to invest in community and culture. And, yeah, okay, uh, you know, there may or may not be a wilderness school um, where all of our listeners are, are, are living. Actually, there's a lot. I mean, there's, we've, we've got a network of 200 wilderness schools now across the U.S. doing similar work to what I'm doing, many of them running rites of passages. Um, but to build those relationships, right? Like, like if you and I, you know, we're friends, we're brothers, uh, we connect. And there's times when I may be there for your boys, and there's times when you may be there for mine. And by working together like that, then our boys have a stronger network of adult males that they can rely on. That's the vision, you know. And I'm not saying, you know, we've achieved that perfectly. But to hold that vision, you know, who are... Because because who are going to be my boys' mentors? I need to trust them, right? I, I as their dad, I'm not just going to throw them to anybody. Oh yeah, I, I mean, well, I don't want my boys disappearing into the wilderness with just an old person who says they're going to take them out exactly, right? on a rite of passage. Now, before we we kind of get into the nuts and bolts of of the types of rites of passage that you do, and I actually want to ask you about this network that you just alluded to of of. Right. I guess, you know, places that folks can go do a rite of passage. What does it look like? Like you mentioned, for example, when you take a, what I'd like to know is what it looks like for a young man, like a boy to do a rite of passage to cross over that threshold into becoming a man, but then also what it looks like when one is embarking upon a rite of passage later in life, like an adult rite of passage. Can you walk me through kind of the nuts and bolts of what it, what it actually looks like? Like, does someone show up and you give them a, you know, an old, ratty backpack and tell them to go disappear off in the wilderness <laughs> for a week or how does it actually look yeah yeah well so so we have this distinction then between our age and our stage and there's the ideal scene and then there's reality so yeah in the ideal scene every young person you know at the age of 18 to 24 would have a mentor who's been mentoring them or a, or a team of mentors and would take them through that rite of passage but not everyone gets that you know obviously uh, we know that and so the essential question that I think we need to address is, you know, can you still make up for it? If I'm 30 or if I'm 40 or if I'm 60, can I still go have that? And the answer, thankfully, is yes. Um, so what does it look like, you know, to step you through it? Um, again, the, in the ideal scene, the rite of passage is part of a bigger, a longer mentoring journey. So, you know, if, if you 
do a Google search on rites of passages, you can find them. You can find men's rites of passage or women's rites of passage. And the vast majority of what you're going to find, 95% of what's out there, are going to be a weekend or maybe a, a week long or maybe a two week long, but a limited time frame experience. You're going to go and essentially have that process. You know, you're going to have some sort of a, a framing experience for a couple days or more um, where there's some mentoring happening and then there's going to be some sort of a uh, challenge, right? So, so when we look at rites of passage, right, there's the three classic phases. There's separation, ordeal, and reintegration. So for a rite of passage to occur, it's got to start with separation. It's got to start with leaving the familiar. Um, that's why I'm a big believer that a rite of passage can't be facilitated by parents. Uh, and I know you're asking about the adult one, but even going back to the adolescent rite of passage, it can't be done by dad, actually because the boy or the girl is dependent on those parents. So for them to go, the young person to go through a rite of passage, they actually, by definition, are leaving, starting to leave that stage of dependence. So they need to leave mom and dad and have other community members taking them through the process. Um, but yeah, so separation, ordeal, reintegration, separation, leaving the known, leaving the nest, leaving home, leaving um, the familiar, and then going to some some new place, right? Being and having an experience that's held by individuals who themselves are are initiated in whatever phase that person's going to step into. So, can you get I'm more specific? Year, like, like just walk me through, like, like exactly what yeah. it looks like, where people go, what they do, what they bring with them. Like, like get, yeah. get into brass tacks here. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and again, it can it can go a lot of different ways. Um, Say for a, a young person who's 18, you know, who's or 25, 24, uh, ready to do that. Um, in the ideal scenario, um, they're going to have that mentoring relationship, so there's going to be preparations ahead of time where they are looking back at that previous phase of life and asking, what are the gifts that I'm taking with me? What am I leaving behind? And there's there's reflection on that. Then there's the actual experience itself. And there's a lot more to it. I'm not going to cover every last detail, but, but then there's the experience itself. So, um, yeah, in the ideal scene, going into some remote, um, area of wild nature, being, having mentors, you know, having guides who are initiated adults themselves that take them through a process where they're going to have, uh, and it can involve a lot of different things. Probably the most common element here and, you know, for, for Western Americans is going to be, um, it's going to be the vision quest, right? Where they're going to spend those, those days, those four days alone, uh, in, in a, in a quiet place in nature. Hey, I want to interrupt today's show to tell you about how you too can turn your, your car, your workout, your commute, you name it, into a traveling university. I'm almost always listening to podcasts and audiobooks when you see earbuds in my ear, when you see something plugged in uh, into my car and uh, cable going into my phone. I'm typically not jamming to uh, Tiesto or Kygo or any deep house music. I'm typically not playing top 40. I am usually listening to a book or a podcast to make me smarter. That's how I go through a lot of books. And I was pretty excited when I saw that uh, this company, Penguin Random House, which has a whole bunch of audiobooks you can't find other places, is now making audiobooks. Uh, they have Dan Harris's Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. They've got Find Your Why by Simon Sinek. They've got a bunch of really good fiction out there. They have the new Clive Cussler book, The Rising Sea. Uh, anyways, uh, a fantastic library of books over there. And uh, you can go to tryaudiobooks.com slash Ben Greenfield. When you go over there, uh, you get listening suggestions. You can refresh uh, with new audiobooks at any time that you want to. They've got health and wellness books. They've got thrilling, fast-paced novels. You name it. It's all over there. And it's a very simple URL, tryaudiobooks.com slash Ben Greenfield. That's tryaudiobooks.com slash Ben Greenfield. Uh, this podcast is also brought to you by Organic. Organifi. Uh, Organifi makes these juices. They have a red juice, they have a green juice, they have a gold juice. And rather than you needing to go out and purchase a bunch of vegetables,
vegetables and beets and berries and turmeric and everything else and chop and cut and clean and blend and make a big mess in your kitchen, you just take one simple, clean, elegant scoop of this stuff. You drop it into your blender or into a cup of water. Give it a shake, give it a stir, give it a blend. Uh, my kids make themselves red smoothies now with the Organifi red juice before they go to school. It's fantastic for their blood flow, fantastic for their brains. It's got adaptogenic herbs in it. This stuff's totally safe for children uh, and adults, believe it or not. Uh, they even do a nighttime golden juice blend made from turmeric and coconut milk, cinnamon, ginger, lemon balm, and reishi for you to cuddle up with for a good night of sleep. They are pretty much the best tasting organic powders out there, and you get 20% off of anything from Organifi. Very simple. You go to Organifi.com. That's with an I, Organifi.com, and the discount code that you use over there is, is Greenfield, and that's at Organifi.com, and use discount code Greenfield. How do they find that quiet place in nature? Like, and, and what do they have with them? Like, are you, I mean, you know, we've got Naked and Afraid where people show up with a TV crew and they just got to kind of plant in the same place for 21 days and then hike their way out. But, you know, let, let's say let's say I were to show up and I were to personally want to go on a rite of passage. And, you know, you know, you and I have known each other for a few years. So let's say perhaps that you were the, the mentor I was turning to for something like that. Like, do you, do you hand me a knife and a bag of trail mix and tell me, go to this spot in nature with your GPS satellite phone and just sit there for four days? I mean, how does it actually play out when it comes to the nuts and bolts? Yeah. No, there's going to be very limited gear. Uh, it's going to be, um, uh, it's going to be like, it'd be like maybe a wool blanket, maybe not, depending on the time of year, depending on the weather. Um, it's going to be, you know, as the idea is to make ourselves vulnerable to the natural world. So that starts with the physical aspect. So there's going to be no food. There's going to be limited water, um, but, but you would, you would have water, um, very little shelter, you know, just kind of just enough to, so that you can survive, but that you can, you know, you can connect with the natural world. If, you know, on the one end of the spectrum, if you went out there in an RV, <laughs> right. Or if you went out there with fancy tents and knives and da all this gear, um, or even primitively, if you had a big, fa- you know, fancy primitive shelter that you spent days working on, that really insulates you. So the idea is to go out there with very little and expose yourself. In terms of finding the spot, um, classically, you know, it's it's going to be the main location would be selected by that guide, that mentor, and then the specific place you would take some time and you would follow, you know, your own heart and walk out on the land and kind of like uh you know a magnetic a, a connection you would just find yourself you probably experience this others probably have you know when we walk in nature certain places call to us so you'd have a place that, that calls to you and then you'd claim that perhaps mark the four directions now now for this for this land that one is walking out on let's say they were to be going through your program or one of these folks who you have run these programs is it those people's lands well i mean it could it could be a variety of different places in terms of the specific land so sure i mean sometimes we, we run programs on, uh, on on private property but it could also be uh, you know, uh, wilderness area, maybe BLM or national forest or whatnot. Okay, yeah, so like like public land, that type of thing. Sure, sure. Okay, got it. And and as far as where they go, how who is you know? Let's say obviously, if someone's coming into you or someone else for a rite of passage, and they're you know they're they're immature to a certain extent. I mean, maybe they are trying to cross that threshold into manhood, and there's some you know some kid from san francisco who's never spent much time in nature and who has decided hey you know what i listen to this podcast i've decided i really want to learn what it takes to become a man and Mm -hmm. you know they've perhaps they they come to you and they get mentored a few times and maybe they go through one of your survival camps and then they get sent out on this rite of passage how do you know that they're safe like is there some kind of tracking beacon on them like if i were to send my boys out on a rite of passage like how do i know they're not just going to disappear into the wilderness and get eaten by a bear yeah good question well that's part of the function of the guide of course is to ensure safety so a we would select a site that's going to be safe uh and b you know there's there's going to be check-ins classically what i do is have a little um a little place. I, I, I don't like to disturb people, generally speaking, when they're on the, on the actual 
uh, in, when they're in their, their actual rite of passage. Um, it's, it's important for them to just have that aloneness. So what we do is uh, we might have a little marker circle of rocks, you know, a distance away, and then every morning at dawn the person comes out and puts a, a unique, makes a shift in the rocks in such a way that I know that that was done by them. You know, we have a pre-agreement gotcha. ahead of time. Um, so, th- so there's a, there's a check and balance system there to make sure everyone's safe. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Got it. And so th- this person's out there with whatever equipment they've been provided with, you're ensuring that they're, they're checked in on that they're safe. And how many, how many days is someone typically embarking upon a rite of passage in a situation like that? Yeah. And again, uh, there's different stages, life of stages and different, uh, rites of passage. So if we're talking about the rite of passage into adulthood, you know, and that it's a facilitated experience, that's going to be, you know, three, four days, typically four days, 96 hours, four full cycles of, of, the, of the sun. And during that time, they're providing for their, their, for their own food? Nope, fasting. Okay, so you're fasting the whole yeah. time. And, and yeah. are, are, does, does uh, the person who's out doing the rite of passage, do they have a book or a journal or anything along those lines? Some places will will do that. They'll have people take journals out. I don't like to. I like to give people just the pure experience. So, uh, you know, the act. It's, there's kind of a meditation like quality to it, right, Ben? There's there's this act of getting real still and quiet in yourself, and holding that essential question. You know, what does it mean to be a man? Why am I here? And so then it's it's asking really in a spiritual way for answers and classically and again this is a classic piece of indigenous wisdom is that those answers come to us when we're in that place of inner silence so a lot of the you know when i did my first vision quest my mentor was like uh, part of the prerequisite was uh, go to a sit spot you know find a little place in nature and just go there for like 20 minutes every day for a year and only after you've done that will i put you on a vision quest you know i'm i, I don't put guys people through that um but that's you know that that was that was a reasonable challenge because what did I learn there I learned to get comfortable just on my own outside of nature I learned what it was to quiet my mind I got to know my place and that was all preparation for the bigger rite of passage the bigger vision quest and then what did your rite of passage look like well when I when I did mine yeah it was it was four days um, in the in the pine barrens of, of New Jersey and it was just a small circle right it was like a 10-foot diameter circle that I was basically locked into unless I had to go to the bathroom or go check my marker box to let them know, hey, I'm safe. Um, I was there. So part of it was simply being quiet, really, real quiet, like not just not speaking, but quieting my mind and holding that question, finding that passion within me. What is my vision? What does it mean to be a man? Why am I here? You know, it's the, to the extent, I mean, the individ, the initiate, right? We can use that word. The initiate has got to connect with their own sense of passion, you know, and 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 give from that place, you know, whether it's a prayer or an intention. Um, some people, you know, are comfortable with you know prayer. Others, not so much. That's fine either way. But the bottom line is connecting with that passion and that intention. Um, and then there's, you know, there's uh, there's different things that can happen. And no two experiences are going to are going to be the same. So there's, uh, but definitely the solitude, the fasting, um, those are key elements. And uh, some other elements in there could be uh, sometimes you can be dancing for your, for your vision, right? You can be literally um, pouring your that passion into uh, physical movement on the land. Sometimes it's prayer. Sometimes. Um, Sometimes it's dreams. Honestly, the most powerful dreams I've had in my life happened to me on on vision quests and rites of passage. And that's really how our soul speaks to us, is through dreams, images, signs, symbols, um, nature connection moments. I had a, uh, my second vision quest, I had a thousand pound bull moose come down and bed down 10 feet from me, well, 15, um, scared the hell out of me. I, I was, you know, uh, in, in that state, I was sure that it was coming to kill me, you know. Um, and maybe symbolically it was. Maybe it was coming and killing the young man 
so the man could be born. Tell me that story. There's more to that story. I think I've heard, <laughs> I, I, I think you've talked about that a little bit before, but we've got time. Delve into this moose story because this occurred during your rite of passage, right? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, it's two parts. It's two parts. So, um, so on my second vision quest, this would have been, oh gosh, 2001. Uh, I was in the Green Mountains of Vermont, uh, where I was studying in a wilderness school. I was 20. Five years old, I think, um, and I'd done one before, so <laughs> I kind of thought I had it down, right? I had a little bit of arrogance going on, although I didn't realize it. And I decided I was gonna, I was gonna go off on one by myself, which I definitely do not recommend for people. Um, and was recommend, I was recommended against doing that, but I was like, no, 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 I can do this. I've done one before, so I went out into the Green Mountains, uh, Stratton Mountain, Vermont, Southern Vermont. And, uh, yeah, I just created a base camp with a tent and brought food and stuff. And then from there, trekked in another mile into the wilderness, uh, you know, noting landmarks along the way, picking the perfect spot um, close to the peak of of Stratton Mountain there. And uh, a lot happened during that time. But it was on my second day. Um, You know, a lot of that time, it's just you relaxing into being alone in nature, Right. And that can be challenging. That can be uncomfortable. Um, but it's all worth it. Right. So anyway, so uh, in, into my second day, um, I'm, I'm just kind of sitting there and kind of in my meditation. And I'd had some, a couple of smaller animal encounters. I think an owl had flown by and, and, uh, you know, there was like squirrels and chipmunks and stuff. And, and I hear this. Now, now this is a different story than the one I, I I think I told last time, but okay. I, I hear this huge crashing um, coming in. I was facing, let's see, I was facing south, so this was coming in from the east, and and I was sitting up against this small red maple tree, and there was I was pretty much surrounded by shrubs, right, like four or five feet high shrubs, so I didn't have a good view from my seated position. So I'm hearing this crashing. I'm like, oh god, this something's coming and I figured you know deer um, but honestly I had I had seen a lot of track and sign I'd seen big the big scat piles of moose and and everything uh, on my way in and as this sound gets closer it's just like I can almost feel the ground shaking right and I'm just like oh my I get this fear rising up you know my, my heart starts beating I swear it was like gonna jump out of my chest and sure enough you know from my vantage seated vantage point I could just see like the top half of the head and these massive, massive antlers. You know, I mean, those things are huge, right? This thing was like seven foot high at the ch- at the at the back or so, and uh, I'm just like, oh my god! And right now, I'm two days in. I haven't eaten. I'm fasting. Um, you know, it's an altered state of consciousness. And for me, uh, I was scared. <laughs> I'll own it. You know, hundred percent. And so. Oh man, my mind just, and so, so it comes in and it slows down. And as it slows down, I'm like, Oh my God, you know, and sometimes you have to face that. You have to part of the rite of passage sometimes and growing up is facing your fears, right? And, and that's okay. We're so averse to facing fears in our modern world. It drives me nuts. We're so overprotected by our parents now and everything else. But part of my message is it's okay to face your fears, right? So here I am facing my fear. I'm sure this thing is going to come charge me, right? It's like irrational, right? Uh, most d- don't just charge people for no reason. Maybe, you know, if it's, if it's got a baby or something or if it's there in the rut, um, if it's mating season. But this is just a lone uh, bull moose, and it was September, so uh, getting close to, to mating season, but uh, not quite there. Anyway, so it comes in and just slows down and just plops down. And I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me. You know, my heart was just like racing and racing. And uh, it, I don't know how much time went by. I mean, I lost all track of time. Um, it felt like hours. But um, on the one hand, I was kind of freaking out internally. I'm like planning my escape. I'm like, oh, my God, what do I do if this thing charges me? Do I climb the tree? You know, do I do I run away? Um, I was really in the midst spell of that fear, right? Um, and yet there was a, another part of me that was just like, uh, it's hard to put into words, but it was, it was like feeling the, the bigger connection that was happening. 
And so eventually um, the moose, you know, stands up and, and goes on its way, uh, not towards me. <laughs> and of course I was fine. Uh, later on, yeah, it took me some time to process that and I really struggled. And, um, and this is where a guide is really key because you can have these powerful experiences, but to integrate them, to process them, to have them, to have the lessons reflected back to you, you re- a person really needs a guide, a guide who's been through that, a guide who um, has been initiated, who's gone through the vision quest themselves. So I struggled, and then what did I wind up doing? I wound up seeking out a guide after the fact to help me process my experience. And and he he was helpful, you know. Uh, luckily, I was able to find someone pretty quick. Um, but I really needed that. And so part of what um, you know, what he told me, he, he was, has an old, he, he was a great guy, and, um, with an old connection to, to the natural world and mentored by uh, indigenous elders himself. And he talked about that power of the, of the moose and, uh, and that fear, you know, when I was in that fear as really being more of a transmission state of connecting with that moose and, you know, helped me see that oh, what I was doing was really releasing that fear. And, you know, sometimes that's what we have to do. We have to kind of, we have to go through it. You know, we don't get to skip it. So that was part one. And years later, which is actually just a couple of years ago, um, I found myself here in Idaho um, not feeling the full fulfillment from my, my work at Twin Eagles that I once had. And so I was like, I could sense that a new phase was coming. So I went on another vision quest, um, this time up to a place called Hunt Lake out south of uh, Priest Lake, a little beautiful little mountain lake. And uh, I was up on this scree field, right, close to the, the, the Hunt Peak. Um, not quite on the peak, but this is like where there's just a field of boulders, right? What would you call tiny, it, a, like, a scree field? Scree field. So there's a, it's just like a, a mountainside covered in rocks and boulders, some small as a golf ball, all the way up to the boulders as big as a car. And I picked one that was huge and kind of positioned where it was flat on top, and underneath there was a cave. And, uh, and I used that as my spot. Again, a four day process, most of the time spending time on top of the rock. But a couple of times when a big rainstorm came in and would swirl around this kind of mountain, uh, this, li- this little mountain lake, like cause there was the, the, the bowl right there that was, it was sitting in, um, the wind and the clouds would just swirl around like a, like a tornado or, or a vortex in there. And, you know, this intense rain came in. So I would just, at that point, I ducked underneath the big rock and there was a big enough opening in there. I could stay dry. So it was like a little cave. And, uh, but before I did that, on this first night, I had brought a small tarp with me because uh, it was later on in the season and the temperatures were cold and I didn't want to get soaked because I knew if I got soaked, I'd, I'd actually be in physical trouble. So I had a, just a little eight by 10 tarp. Um, and I made, before, you know, I found, realized that the cave was there, I made this little shelter for myself and it rained all night on me. And I had limited water, you know, I was going on like, a quart a day, I think, uh, which is pretty low, right? Recommend, recommended is like a gallon a day. So it was about a quarter of, of what I should have been at uh, normally. And so I had my little water bottle. Well, at some point during the night, under this tarp in the rain, I, I, uh, my elbow knocked the water bottle and it falls down in amongst the rocks, you know, where I couldn't easily reach it. And, and I, I, I was physically conscious when that happened. It was like the middle of the night. And then I, I go back into my sleep and I have this dream. And in my dream, I go after my water bottle and I crawl down in there. And I don't find the water bottle, though. In the dream, what I find is this big, giant moose. Um, and it was white and glowing, right? And uh, it was like the spirit of, of the moose. And it was that same moose that I had seen physically. Oh, that's crazy. In that, in, that, uh, in that vision quest 10 years prior. And, uh, and, and there was this whole moment of connection in the dream. And I processed that later with my, with my guide. And for, for me, what that was representing was the completion of something. Like moose was an animal that, you know, I was walking with, you could say, during those years, spiritually speaking, you know, the, with the medicine of moose and it helped me start the school and, 
and, uh, and there was a real connection there. And it was like I graduated the moose years, kind of, right, to, wow. to use that kind of modern term. So is a moose that, like your spirit animal? Well, at that, you know, I've, I've really, I've really connected with that. You know, I'm, I'm always sensitive about that language. I, I, I have such a reverence for all of this, Ben, you know, and, and for the natural world. So I always hesitate a little to, to say a quick yes. Uh, and again, I was trained traditionally by indigenous people where it's a real sacred thing. But, but yeah, I think in my heart, um, I, I do have that kind of connection with, with the moose. Um, but it's never anything I, I would want to, you know, be arrogant about or, or boast about or anything like that. Interesting. My kids are always, yeah. uh, Terran is usually a panda bear or, and or a polar bear, polar bear and river is right. typically a sea yeah. otter for their spirit animals. I'm usually a gray wolf or uh-huh. an eagle or a falcon or a hawk or some kind of flying bird of prey. It's interesting what kind of comes to you when you begin to analyze yourself, what your spirit animal would be. What about for a boy doing a rite of passage? How would that be different than a man doing a rite of passage? Are the boys typically paired up with, with other young men? Are they off by themselves? Uh, is, is there Are there different considerations where we're talking about you know young men or people who we might even consider to be? Because they kind of are until they've finished right. the rite of passage, still kids. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. I mean, it's, it's, they're in a different phase of life. They're not as old. They're not as physically capable. So it's a different process that they're going to be taken through. But there's a lot of similarities, right? Like typically for boys, what I take them through is maybe a 24 hour, um, solo. And they're not asking the, the big question of what's my purpose. You know, they're just stepping into what does it mean to be a young, to be a teenager? What does it mean to be a, a young man? What does it mean to be an adolescent? Um, so there's more guiding, there's more connection time, there's less solo time, but there's an element of that, right? And so where they get to just be on their own with wild nature, with spirit, with God, you know, however you want to uh, phrase that, but there's still that essential element of it. And then we can look back because there's actually rites of passage. Um, there's something we call the rite of competence that a, a child goes through when they're maybe seven Right. If we're really going to flesh out the full developmental cycle, when a child, you probably remember this with your boys, uh, uh, when they started to be able to help out more around the house and, you know, when they weren't just totally dependent and constantly needing input and they were starting to be able to help out, you know, competent when they were becoming competent. Um, and in that time, like when I, I took my boys through this, I gave them a right of competence. And it was literally like they spent an hour and a half sitting in the teepee in the, in the, in the woods, you know. Um, so it was like this micro uh, solo, this micro vision quest. But the point even in that was kind of the same, like, okay, spend time just with yourself and, and be brave, you know, and, and just have that time to yourself. And, of course, the whole community was there uh, holding the, the space before and after. Um, but you know, it's, it's also worth talking about emotional maturity, um, because right now we've spoken a lot about the, the, our, the rite of passage itself or the vision quest, which of, I mean, yes. But again, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to see it in a bigger context. And so especially for maybe the listeners out there, one of the big pieces, and this is what I did not get from my indigenous mentors, um, is the piece of emotional maturity and training modern people, you know, as you said, if there's some 18 year old out there who's, you know, listening to this and getting pumped up, part of it is about learning what does it mean, emotionally speaking, to be a man. David Data, Way of the Superior Man, mm-hmm. King Warrior Magician Lover, these guys uh, totally know, know this journey. Um, and so, you know, simply put, as men, are we aware of our feelings, our emotions, and are we accepting of them in ourselves, and are we expressing them? Right? This is basic emotional intelligence. We're not getting it in the modern experience. Um, there's men's groups out there, there's rites of passage, you know, where, where you can get this, but that's a process, you know, and young people need to be exposed to mentors, especially males, right? There's this old story that you're either 
what are the options? You can either be a machismo kind of bully, or you can be the wimp, right, and, and just collapse. Um, yeah, those, those are one? those are two of the personality types you find in that that book, the King yeah. Warrior Magician Lover book. They're two kind of yeah, exactly. ends of the spectrum on that book. Right. So there's a third way, and and that's so. What does it mean to be an emotionally mature man? What does it mean to be able to stand up? feel my feelings, express them, speak my truth powerfully, but not use that, not use my power to hurt others, you know? And so I have a spine, right? I'm not that collapsed uh, energy of anybody can just walk all over me, but I'm also not out there doing damage, right? Hurting people emotionally or, or, or physically or otherwise. I know my truth. I know who I am. I stand up for that. I ask for what I want. I know that I may not always get it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my own back, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for what I want, and, and I'll be there for my brothers and for my wife and for my community and for the kids. You know, I've got this strength. I'm a man. I've, I've got this life experience. I've got these gifts. That's not just for me. That's to give. So I'm an asset to my community. Interesting. So that's a huge piece, so- you know, training young people and training adults in emotional maturity. And that's a huge part of what's missing in our world. And so with rite of passage work and vision quest work and purpose discovery work, um, that's a essential element, essential element. So with somebody like, like, let's say river and Taryn, you know, they're, they're uh, 10 year old twin boys right now. They've been to your wilderness survival school. They've been to your, some of your camps and will probably continue to kind of attend your camps each year. Do they reach a certain point where you're like, okay, these guys are ready. They're ready for the rite of passage. And if so, how does that look and what happens then? Yeah. 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 So typically around the age of 13, like I said, when puberty kicks in, um, and this, you know, in, in their case, I will have, I mean, cause what, they were six when I first met them, I think. Yeah. Uh, so I will have known them at that point for what is that? Six, seven years. Um, so, you know, I'll be seeing them at least a couple times a year would be the idea. Uh, if, if not more and watching for those signs, of course, you and Jess are watching them grow. Uh, and, and what starts happening? Puberty starts kicking in. They start getting uh, less, less interested in all the family routines and the stuff happening in the home and they start individuating, right? So they start being more interested in, you know, it's the classic teen scene, right? Think how important the social setting is for teenagers. That's developmentally appropriate. You know, they need that. They need to separate socially to some extent from the parents and the family and move into a a greater social scene. That's that's natural and normal. So, you know, we're looking for these signs. They're stopping. Uh, the, the fantasy play is, is kind of trailing off, and maybe they're starting to have romantic interests. Um, these are all the classic signs. So then, you know, at that point, um, I would, you know, I, we'd, we'd be talking, and I would, we'd be watching and saying, hey, they're ready. They're, they're exhibiting the signs. So then we'd start um, start talking about it, and, you know, there would be a conversation between you and I and, and Jessa. And part of that, I really see that conversation starts with the parents because it's like, okay, are you ready for this? Right? There's a lot of parents that when their kids get to that age, they can't hack it. They're, they're still tied in with their child as a, as a child. And, they, and so they need mentoring oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, just to let go, right? And start to really take a deeper look at the relationship. And then it's going to be some sort of a calling. You know, I always, I always send a calling letter to the boys. Um, I, don't, I don't put it out there as an invitation. I don't say, hey, do you, like, uh, you know, I don't treat it like a summer camp. I don't say, hey, do you want to come to camp? Or, hey, do you want to come do this rite of passage? The way I see it, life's going to happen. Adolescence is going to happen. You know, or just the same. Adulthood's going to happen. So the question is not, is it going it's gonna happen so what are we doing to prepare for it Mm -hmm. yeah so when they're under 18 my take on it is the same as like you know how would as a parent i i choose if my child goes to school or not and where they go right i they don't pick i do and so i have the same philosophy some people would call that rigid that's okay but the way i see it adolescence is going to happen 
they're going to have to face challenges. So what am I doing? What are we doing to prepare them? So the way that unfolds is I send them a letter and I say, hey, your rite of passage is coming. I don't ask them. I tell them. And I say, get ready. You know, start preparing your gear. Um, and I give them questions. You know, and then I'll hop on the phone with them maybe. And there's typically a small group going through the experience together. Ideally, they've got their friends, similar age, similar stage, also going through it, you know, and we might take six, four to 10, four to 12 oh, wow. um, boys through together um, because it's a tremendous bonding experience, Ben. The, the boys I've taken who've gone through and become young men, the young men I've taken through who have become adults, the people they go through that with, like their peers, those bonds are like, they're like blood brothers. Hmm. Man, it's amazing, the bonds. And, and what and exactly that, is it that, that they're doing there? In the in the adolescent rite of passage, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so there's going to be that preparation phase. They're going to get ready. Uh, they're going to put their gear together. They're going to start reflecting. They're going to look back on what were the gifts of childhood that I'm the, the, the essential qualities I'm I'll always cherish and have with me. What are the childish qualities I'm letting go of? Um, yeah, and then again, that would be the same for an adult one. You know, just looking back, generally speaking, on the previous life phase asking the questions, what am I taking with me? What am I letting go of? Um, and, and you know, I'll be honest, there's mystery elements that I don't give away. And that, that cause they've got to be, there has to be a surprise element for them. If they knew everything they're going to face, it would ruin it because life doesn't work that way. Right. We all face unknown challenges in life where shit happens <laughs> and we have to deal. So have we had training in our lives dealing with the un- with unknown challenges that just come up spontaneously? That's probably the, one of the biggest gifts a rite of passage can offer a person is, you know, them facing some challenges of that, that are unknown. And again, we have this society that's so controlling and we got to know everything and it's all got to be accounted for. And then we struggle and we wonder why. You know, yeah. but the old school traditional way no no the person wouldn't know what they're going into so i I'm, i've shared a lot actually um but there's definitely uh, mystery challenges as well yeah i feel as though you know i, I kind of sort of pieced together some of my own rites of passage as i did you know the spartan delta and the agoji yeah. and the kokoro yeah. camp and all these crazy masochistic endurance events and crucibles that i put myself through i feel like to a certain extent I was doing because I never felt like I crossed that threshold into becoming a man and had to prove to myself that I really could rise to the occasion. I could train myself how to do things like like bow hunt or how to do things like, you know, learn how to get down to 80 feet in the water free diving with a breath hold yep. and spearfish and how to you know, conquer some of these crucibles like the Navy SEAL crucible and the uh, the Spartan events and a big, big part of that to a certain extent, I think I was searching out because I never personally had a rite of passage. And you might even say that a lot of, you know, the modern day infatuation with many of these so-called, you know, obstacle course races and uh, you know, Spartans right. and Tough Mudders may be to a certain extent, you know, guys and girls seeking out that rite of passage. Absolutely. And I think that we'd probably see a lot less of that constant striving and that constant searching and the people on their 48th ayahuasca retreat and the people who simply don't have any other way to scratch the itch of feeling like a man or feeling like a woman unless they go out and do a, a Spartan race. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but there, there's no distinct, yes, this was the day that I became a man, or this was the day that I found myself, or this was the day that I discovered my purpose. And having that strongly delineated, de, de, delineated, yeah. if that's a word, <laughs> Uh, yeah. st- strongly yeah. defined and uh, and an actual point that someone reaches in their life. That's what I want for my kids. That's what, that's what I want yeah. for them to be able to achieve. And I, I brought up that term purpose. I know yeah. that you, you refer now to this rite of passage, that kind of this network that you've created of people who can take young people or adults on rites of passages as a purpose mountain. Why do you call it purpose mountain? Yeah, so Purpose Mountain is my new my new business uh, that I actually just started um, in the past year here. And for me, Ben, it was it was the next expression of my vision of my purpose. You know, it, it was that vision quest where 
I was in that cave, that scree field on the mountainside, um, where I had the dream of the moose, um, when it really came to me that, okay, you know, connecting people with nature is great, but I'm at a phase in my life now where I'm being called into something deeper. I'm stepping into that next phase of my life. And for me, what that is, is to guide people and to really claim it in a bigger way to guide people to discover their purpose. And so um, I like the idea of Purpose Mountain because, you know, this it's the metaphor that there is this mountain we have to climb, this metaphorical mountain uh, at the top of which lies our purpose. And it's waiting there for us to claim it. But there is a journey that we that we that we must take to get there. So uh, it's, it's the metaphorical uh, uh, purpose mountain. And what I've realized is that, you know, while it's really sexy and fancy, these rites of passage and these, you know, uh, vision quests and everything, and, and yes, they're super valuable. Yes, they meet a deep developmental need. Yes, they address the needs of the psyche. There is still a lot more needed. And so at this phase, I'm actually, <laughs> which is a somewhat radical approach, but I'm, I'm relatively not supportive of people just going out and doing a vision quest and calling it good. My experience has been that people who do that still struggle with feeling, with feeling like they haven't really gotten what they need. And really? I that, the reason, that surprises me. So people go on a rite of passage and they still feel like they don't have their purpose? Well, no, no. What I said is people can go on a vision quest, like the four-day event I was describing, and 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 maybe they're more connected with their purpose, but they're gonna they still struggle to express that purpose, cause, right? Because there's a difference between finding your purpose and living your purpose. And guys like you and I, I think, I mean, let's face it, Ben, we're, we're the exception, right? I mean, I want everyone in the world to like be on track and be successful, but uh, most people out there are are struggling, you know. And I, and I don't say that arrogantly. But, I mean, the struggle is a huge part of, the, of our world today. And I'm convinced, you know, what I found was that I, because I struggled, sure as heck, for a lot of years, even when I was running the wilderness school, uh, which I still am, um, but in the early years. And the big part of the reason for that is because I had these layers of fear and resistance that I wasn't addressing. You know, for me, I had really had the, the old traditional cultures um, up on a pedestal. And definitely there's so much we have to learn from them. But I no longer believe that they hold all of the answers. And it was about, you know, five, seven years ago when I started getting to this point of realizing, oh, I need to be more open to the modern approach, to a modern understanding of the psyche and depth psychology, um, and that there's answers there. And that was when I started my emotional growth journey and really started facing my deepest fears and my deepest resistance and acknowledging it for what it was. And so there's a whole journey, there's a whole mentoring journey of working with those fears and resistance. So many people, those people you're describing on their 48th you know, journey, are still really uh, suffering from all that fear and that resistance. And so many people out there have a sense of, of what they're here to do and yet resist and don't actually do the hard work of implementing um, their, their purpose here in life. And so the answer isn't to just, you know, <laughs> work harder and pound the square peg harder into the round hole. The answer is to pause and to look at with some care and some maturity Oh, what, what is that, uh, resistance and that fear about? And because we all have those parts of ourselves that, you know, like I got a little nervous before the call. Totally natural, right? And there's a part of me that would rather just stay home and eat chips and sit on the couch rather than put That's myself right. out but there. But you're on in the, the world. big, big podcasting stage now. Got to step up. Right, right, yeah. But here's the deal. That part of me that would rather not be here, there's nothing wrong with that. My, the, my job's not to beat that part up or to demonize it. If I want to find success in my life, I need to actually care for that part and realize, oh, what is that? That's a part of me that learned to, to be stay small um, when I was a kid, right? Because it was like, 
this part of me learned that, oh, it's safer to just stay small and not put myself out there, right. not take risks. And, and that was a good thing back then. That was a strategy that worked. I mean, I'm alive. It, it, it got me here. So the answer is not to demonize that and to beat ourselves up for these, those sides of ourselves. The answer is to, to actually appreciate those aspects of us and let them know, hey, life's changed. I'm no longer a kid. The, you know, we, we develop these survival strategies when we're young, and then they, they, they stay with us. Our circumstances change, but the parts of our psyche that act that way, like, it's like they haven't gotten upgraded. They're like running like you know, Microsoft Windows 3.1. It's 20 years outdated, right? And so our job is to, as we step into emotional maturity, is to not cultivate the inner battle, but to cultivate inner peace and find these parts and let them know, hey, it's okay, you know, and then we get into the the deep work. I mean, Gillette and Moore talk about this King Warrior Magician Lover, the book you referenced earlier, Um, the inner parenting journey that, oh, you know, as a kid, I had some needs that weren't met. We all did. No one had the perfect childhood. And we had those survival strategies that our psyches brilliantly responded with, but they haven't gotten updated. So here we are at 30, 40 years old, still with the same survival strategies that, you know, can appear to be holding us back. So the work now is to appreciate those parts and to help them learn to grow up. Uh, and, and not, but not to, not to, you know, continue all that lack of harmony on the, on the inner landscape, you know, and then that's, that's the old adage, right? As long as there's, um, you know, that inner conflict, we're going to have outer conflict, you know, so for all the people listening who are, I mean, it's a big part of my message for anyone out there who's listening, who's struggling with resistance and fear and doubt, you know, A, it's totally normal and natural, nothing wrong with that. B, don't beat yourself up about it, you know, care for yourself, acknowledge those parts of yourself. And if it's a, if it's an ongoing issue that's preventing you from living fully, um, get some support. You know, that's, that's a, 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 a role that I now serve for people is, is within one-on-one mentoring is supporting people um, through their, to work with their resistance, to work with their fear, work with their doubt. Not that that gets to, you know, drive the car of their life and lead the show, but for them to find peace with that, which is huge. So, and so that's, I just want to say, that's the missing piece in the vast majority of deep purpose work out there and vision quest is is people aren't getting the support they need on that on the inner level to actually go and live their purpose um, and that's what i'm really excited to to be bringing the world right now so what's it look like in terms of this whole purpose you know let's say somebody's in new york or they're in florida or wherever and they're like hell yeah i want to get my kids to the point where by the time they're going through puberty that they can embark upon a rite of passage and cross that threshold. Or I myself want to go to a vision quest or rite of passage. Obviously, as we've just alluded to, you don't want to go off into the wilderness with just anybody. And anybody can also slap up a website and, you know, put out a picket sign and say, hey, I'm going to lead people through rites of passage. You don't know who who your kids are going off into the wilderness with. So walk walk me through how Purpose Mountain works, this this business that you've built to actually create things like a rite of passage. Yeah, so Purpose Mountain, I want to be clear, is really designed for adults. Um, So for adults out 18 plus, if, if a person's out there, they're interested Come check out the website, you know, uh, get on my list and let's start connecting um, because I'm, I'm offering at this point, I'm offering one on one mentoring in the future. I'm going to be offering group processes uh, and, and that's, that can start on the phone. You know, we can start building a relationship and laying the foundation for a proper uh, rite of passage and a, or a proper process of discovering purpose. Um, you know, it takes some time. These are these are huge questions. It's not going to happen in a weekend. You know, and, and again, it's our consumeristic society that gets so addicted to, like, fast answers. Part of the message here is encouraging people to slow down and invest in relationships. So anyway, yeah, Purpose Mountain, uh, people can, can, there's different opportunities for people to um, to connect, to build a one-on-one relationship with me. But do they have to travel all the way to Idaho, or do you have you you mentioned that you have some kind of like a network of people in different areas? Yeah, 
So that network is for kids. So if they're, if they're an adult, I can work with people remotely. And then uh, if they're for kiddos, it's a little bit of a different scene. I believe that kids need in-person mentoring. So um, I'm our school, Twin Eagles Wilderness School, is part of a bigger network um, of wilderness schools and deep nature connection mentoring organizations. Um, like I said, 200 strong now across the U.S., um, really all parts of the United States. So uh, there's a website, which is we are nature rising it's we are nature rising dot earth and a good friend of mine uh colleague mark Morey, put this together and it's got a map of all of these different wilderness schools uh, across the country many of which are providing rites of passage work and people can get involved and in, get their kids involved in long-term mentoring relationships um, so that's that we are nature rising that's a great like directory of uh, for people out there if they're looking at getting their kids involved in this kind of work and for adults interested i really encourage them to check out my new website purpose mountain it's just purposemountain.com www.purposemountain.com and i've got a free purpose discovery kit in there that really has these two essential elements one connecting with uh you know loving these parts of yourself and working with the resistance um, sometimes i call that the ecology of self and then two, you know, taking this deeper journey out into nature. Um, and yeah, uh, would would welcome people to come check those resources out. Okay, so then once somebody has checked that out, let's say they want to go and do an actual rite of passage. Let's say I'm a, let's say I'm yep. me, right? Let's say I'm a 36 year old guy, and I'm like, I I want to go out and do a rite of passage. Would I then travel? to Idaho where you're at and you, you equip me with what I would need and then send me off in, into the wilderness? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, step one is going to be make building a relationship. Um, we can do some, we'd be doing some one-on-one -on -one work on the phone or Skype or whatnot. Uh, and then there would come a point where there would be that physical rite of passage, that one, you know, big moment. Um, and, and yeah, th those are in-person events that happen here locally and as as you know purpose mountain grows um that, that i may be expanding that i may start to offer these in different parts of the country um but for right now those are happening uh, and that locally. one big moment you're you're off by yourself or you're with a group of people well that would be the, a group coming together to have a shared rite of passage experience during which time so maybe we'd meet for you know a week and then during that time people are going to go off and have their their solos and then come back and have the community to come back to it to process their experience with. I like that. Hey, so a one combination of community and solo time. Okay. One other question I have for you. Are you going to do another uh, father-son wilderness survival camp again, do you think? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I've actually got one coming up uh, just in about a month, actually. Oh, wow. Um, here, in, here in Idaho, yeah. And that was the first time you and I, well, one of the first times you and I connected Um yeah, so we got that coming up. Okay. Yeah, I take yeah, that. For, for people listening in, by the way, if you have if you have boys, like, I don't I don't know if I'm going to this one in the month, but because uh, I honestly I got to pay close attention to your newsletter, dude. I, I get your newsletters, and I have somebody who monitors my email inbox, and I tell them star the emails from Twin Eagles, and occasionally I just right. I have so many newsletters starred, I don't have time to read them all. The uh, yeah. the father son wilderness survival camp though that's still something my kids talk about that was an amazing time especially when you hid all the children from their fathers and we had to go out and find our kids camouflage and covered <laughs> with mud and sticks in the wilderness that was one highlight the other highlight was the uh, Native American sweat lodge ceremony that us guys did that was yeah. that was epic guys you know screaming and losing their minds and running out into the snow and you know that incredible uncomfortable. Uh, it was claustrophobic. It was hot. There were drums beating. There were hot rocks getting thrown in the middle of this sizzling hole in the middle of the teepee. But that, that was a very intense experience, man. It was very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's quite a description there. I think I think you over dramatized that just a little bit, but <laughs> hey, in my mind, that's that's. Yeah, I know right. you've done it before. That was my first time, right. so I was I was yeah. Yeah, I was, was calm was on initiation. the outside, but I was freaking out on the inside. I can tell you that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, all right. Well, so, 
what I'll do for those of you listening in is I'll put links to all this stuff. If you just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash purpose, that's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash purpose. I will link over to uh, Tim's website and also uh, for, for Twin Eagles Wilderness School, where I first came to know Tim, but also to his his new offering, this Purpose Mountain for adults who want to embark upon a rite of passage. And just so you guys know, I'm, I'm personally planning on my children not only doing their rite of passage when they come of age with Tim and through his program, but I myself really want to go through uh, my own rite of passage and uh, work with Tim to do that because he's one of the one of the guys in this sector who I trust and who I respect and uh, who you know he knows how to wild plant forage he hunts he survives you can set him out into the wilderness with a knife on his back and he'll come back out the other end alive uh, in most cases unless the grizzly bear is just too big uh, but he's he's a guy Hopefully who knows what he's it. doing yes soft spoken family man but uh, also a, a wilderness badass and that's why I respect you Tim well thanks Ben I, I appreciate your good words yeah yeah it's always great connecting with you my friend and uh, yeah you know to any, any of the listeners out there if this is something that that calls to you if this is something that speaks to you come check it out you know uh, I got a lot of free resources especially the Purpose Mountain, uh, come check it out. Um, let's, you know, you can get on my list and make a little relationship. And if, and if things feel right, um, maybe this could really help you out. You know, that's, that's why I'm here. I've awesome. had people who helped me out, and uh, now it's, I, I get the honor of, of, uh, of giving that gift back to others. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Tim. And again, the show notes for those of you listening in are at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash purpose. And until next time, I'm Ben Greenfoot along with Tim Corcoran of Purpose Mountain and the Twin Eagles Wilderness School signing out from bengreenfieldfitness.com. Have an amazing week. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice. 